Okay, good. Well, first of all, thank you all for joining today. Um, I'm Kim Di Nicola, and I am a FinTech Women Board member. And this is my, I'm really excited to be hosting my, my first webinar as part of our virtual series today. Um, before we get started, though, I just have a couple of house keeping issues um, to go over um, just to make sure that, that we're all in sync. So um, as we move forward, just please be sure that your phones are on mute. Um, after some brief introductions, we're going to have um, some presentation conversation for about 30 to 35 minutes. The remaining 10 to 15 minutes um, will be left open for Q&A, so please feel free to use that chat feature that we've used in the past um, for your questions. And there may be some um, points throughout the presentation that um, we will be asking you to kind of provide some, um, some answers. Uh, we want to elicit some responses, so we may be using the chat feature for those times as well. And as always, I want to thank our partners at um, Goodwin for sponsoring us today. Um, so as I was preparing uh, for today's session and reflecting on our goals when we started this offering in April, um, we designed the series to focus on really understanding the new world we found ourselves in, not knowing for how long, but hopefully to come out of this stronger um, and more connected and perhaps even upskilled. But while these have been trying times for sure from a workplace and a working perspective, we've been challenged as never before, and we've all had to quickly pivot into the new virtual reality. And so for many of you, you finally also found yourself simultaneously becoming educators, entertainers, um, and caretakers, primary caretakers of children, while you're also trying to balance your work. There are others who probably are, you know, finding themselves in small apartments with roommates and trying to do the dance in terms of where do I do my work, where do I set up, or in houses with family members um, where you may have found yourself without um, the best and necessary technology to do your work. And it sure, ha it sure has not been easy. As we're approaching you know, the five months here of what's becoming the new normal, it's clear that the semblance of virtual work is something that's gonna be with us really probably um, for the foreseeable future and will likely change the way we're working, um, the working world as we've known it forever. Um, and it's really, for us, it's really moved beyond sort of that emergency measure that I think we all went into. And it's caused us really to think more long-term, um, our professional approach on how uh, we can all best be, you know, leaders, associates, and teammates. So to that end today, what we're really hoping that you're able to walk away from this session with is four key learnings. The importance of building trust and credibility with managers, peers, and for leaders, your teams for sure how your virtual actions create lasting impressions, being very intentional about how you show up, and as we transition to this new norm, you know, really thinking about optimizing traditional work activities related to performance mm -hmm. management, development, uh, onboarding associates, et cetera. So how are we gonna do this? To help us make sense of all of this, I'm thrilled um, to have Stephanie Heider joining us for today's session. And just a bit about her background. As founder and CEO of Bridging Distance, Stephanie has helped pioneer the field of dispersed teaming and leadership since 1997 and is among the nation's leading thinkers and consultants on the human side of virtual work. She enhances people's ability to thrive in the digital workplace through improved productivity at the intersection of technology and relationship building. Stephanie has authored numerous published articles in the area of virtual leadership, teams, and communications. She too is a very busy working mom and in her spare time enjoys hiking, photography, canoeing, and biking. So Stephanie, welcome. And we're so glad to have you with us today. And these sure are unprecedented times. Um, but as you mentioned in your bio, um, remote working is not new. So could you please provide a bit of context for us um, and the evolution, I mean, evolution of remote working over the years? And where we are today. Um, yeah, so so a little bit of both background and uh, for me um, as well as as where we've come. Um, in 1996, I did my master's thesis um, and and how trust develops differently in global teams um, and 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 leadership. And so we put together a timeline here that talks about our evolution as well as what's happening. So in 96, the internet was pretty new. We were sort of wrestling, you know, email was, was still fairly new. We were faxing. Remember that gross paper that everybody hated to touch? And then, and then as we moved along, we first talked about um, virtual global teams. 1998, we were rolling that out. Um, lots of global teams, even though people hadn't talked about it. 
and then all the way up through um, aspects of electronic body language, and even uh, what we call telecommuter. So remote work is a newer term. I actually don't even like the term because I think it connotes remote, which is already too much distance. Um, and then, but we call the telecommuters all the way up to now. So in 2020, bridging distance, we're always doing research. Um, and the research that we are just finishing up now is on this idea of digital isolation and loneliness, which we kicked off last July. And I'll show you a model in a little bit that incorporates some of that um, as we go. So yes, so this is a, a little bit in terms of where that evolution is, so. Great. So again, clearly, you know, this isn't something that, that is terribly new. We've seen lots of roles that this has just been the way of doing business for years with sales, um, merchandising, um, also with consulting. Um, we've also seen as um, a lot of com companies, their, their footprint has expanded. And so we've had to put some individuals into either remote or, or virtual um, working situations. And definitely there have been some advantages for sure, you know, in terms of managing work-life balance for some or, you know, expense management for, for some companies. Um, but, you know, we've never seen anything quite like this where, you know, where we put everybody at home all at once. Um, so clearly this has been the world's largest um, work from home experiment. And as we are now seeing uh, entering this new phase where um, companies are starting to open up either now or, you know, will be within the year, um, what do you see in terms of a model to make this transition easier um, for individuals that will be at some point in some way, shape or form going back into an office or part of teams that are? Um, yeah, so we have a model, let me explain this a little bit, um, a model that we developed we, about a month ago, we started the evolution of this and probably will look different next week or whatever it is. So let me take you through the dimensions of this. But in essence, um, this was driven in, in, in large part by both the experiences that we had in the last few months, as well as over 25 years, and the outcomes of our most recent virtual leadership and digital isolation and loneliness research. So let me take you through this, but I'm gonna ask you each um, at the end of this to plot yourselves on where you are. So I'll, I'll show this again, but I wanna talk to you about what the dimensions are. Across the, um, across the horizontal axis, we have this idea of work locations. So there are people um, who are going from, you know, way back when, when it was one building, maybe all employees commute to one shared office building all the way over to multiple buildings. We become more global, sometimes in multiple countries. Some people, you know, but they're all, most people going um, to the buildings. Then we have this idea of some building and some homes. So some people are working full time remotely. Some people are um, working a little bit remotely a couple days a week. This idea of co-working. So um, some of those working space, work bars, all those also gets introduced all the way up to this continuum to the far right on everybody's working from home, which is exactly where we were March, April, even to an extent, May. So I want you to think about in your current situation or a, a, a previous situation, where would you say in terms of work locations, where would you put yourself on a continuum of one to five? In a couple of minutes, I'll ask everybody to chat that out. Um, the second dimension, which then goes up on the vertical, is this idea of the degree of team-based work needed. So the higher interdependency you have, the higher it is that you need to work together. So going from this idea of cooperation where we just kind of share information and it's nice if we can do that, a little bit more interdependent and team-based work where you have to kind of align activities, all the way up to collaboration where it is really do or die in terms of actively working together. And so the higher you have the interdependency is the higher need for engagement, commitment, belonging, and people's ability to add value. And what we saw happen is that in this sudden remote situation is that people who were highly in, in, in highly team-based environments all of a sudden were remote and didn't have the foundational aspects in order to do that. And so that's where people were, you know, they we throw technology at it, but it's still people who have to be motivated to use that technology. So how do you do that? So I'm going to ask you again to also plot then on one to five where you are relative to um, the, the team base. So if you want to do that out now, one being low and five being high, just put in the chat and Kim will monitor that where you are. 
So team, one to five, five being high. And then locations, where are you in um, one building or is everybody in your organization remote? Um, and it's not gonna be science, it's just kind of nice for people to think about that. And while we're doing that, I wanna go over this third axis, which is basically, um, it's the 90 degree plot that goes up and we'll clean this up in a little bit as, as we evolve it. But in essence, what happens here is that when you go, let me go back to this for a minute, when you start on that bottom left-hand corner where you have, um, you know, you only have to cooperate a little bit, you're just maybe sharing information and everybody's in the same building, you can really function with informal and implicit or, or information that floats in the air. So that means that agreements and processes and reliable technologies and the ability at, at, and, and formal things are really a nice to have. And then as you go up um, the scale and you move to that top right hand corner where you have everybody from home and you have a high degree of collaboration, it is a must to have agreements, processes, guidelines, um, reliable technologies, all those pieces. And so going up on that scale, that's where I want you to think about in your environment, um, you know, where are you relative to how many people are fully remote and, and the degree of cooperation? Because what happens there is what we have then is this absolute need for those structures to be in place. But, um, in, and it's really a move towards this idea of results-based performance management, which we'll talk some about. But, but what happens is in the world, we, we are often now having hybrid locations for a couple of reasons. One is because some places in the country and some places in the world are opening up faster. Some jobs and areas lend themselves to, um, to being able to stay home, whereas others are essential. So we have this hybrid location, which makes things really, really complex. Um, and so Kim, um, what do we have in terms yeah. of people chatting that out? I'd love to hear it. So in terms of team, it's really across the board that, you know, some people are actually, you know, in the office, where the, whereas others are completely at home. For individuals, we're, it's looking, you know, most like from, you know, the some office to all the way at home. Um, so it's, it's really kind of a blend there. Okay. Um, okay, so then um, this hybrid is sort of in the middle, right? And so you can see how the, the, the graph reflected that. But there's a couple of points in terms of why it's so complex. And that is um, the points here, and, and I won't go into it in a lot of detail. You can see this, you know, for yourself or take a screenshot or look at the recording. But pockets of teams can be effective without explicit operating agreements. So the people in that bottom left-hand corner don't really need it because they can find each other. They can do a quick drive-by pop down the queue, whatever it is. Um, but home office people require those formal agreements because um, they can't find each other. They don't have that same sense of visibility to each other. The other aspect to that is that often senior leaders are coming into the office because they need and want access to each other, in part because of that, but also in part, you know, truthfully, because they're older and they're much more used to that way of working. And so people have better access to that information because we're not making it explicit. Um, culture and access to information varies by location. And so again, meet, has the differing needs for formal processes. Um, and those people who are co-located don't really recognize the need for formalization because they are not hamstrung in any way or most ways do that. And we actually call this proximity bias. We, until March, we called it remote worker bias, but really shifting that. And proximity bias really is unconscious really thinking about the fact that people who are closest to us, um, we are, they are the go-to people, they get promoted faster, um, it's easier for them to get access to information, they have higher visibility to the people that, that have, and they have more robust in-person networks. Um, I'm not going to talk much about proximity bias here, but I could talk about it forever, so reach out to me if you want. Um, we're putting together a blog and some other information on it. Um, so, Moving into the tips, Kim. Sure. And I think that's a really interesting piece about the hybrid model, because I know when you and I initially talked, I mean, I just sort of assumed that that probably would be the easiest, right? Some in the office, some out of office. And so it was really interesting um, to hear, you know, that that is the, is the most complex. Um, so, you know, thinking about how you do 
create that level of trust. Um, you know, it, it, I think about um, how that's typically built through like team building exercises, group projects, even community volunteering, all those sorts of things. So, you know, how can you share some examples in terms of, you know, thinking about building that explicit trust, um, how we can do that in, um, you know, in a virtual environment? Yeah, I mean, uh, so one of the things is if you have one person who's remote, I've been saying this since, you know, the late 90s, if you have one person who's remote, you have to act as a virtual team mm -hmm. and a virtual leader and not act as an in-person team with an outlier. Um, otherwise, it's not going to be successful and that person will leave. Um, um, so in terms of thinking about trust, Kim, that's, that's a great question in terms of the experiences. So we talk about uh, trust as the state of readiness for unguarded interaction with somebody. And so it becomes the basis for an environment where you're able to cooperate with the team, um, you're able to rely on the person, you're able to take thoughtful risk and experience believable communications. So that means that it, 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 it trust bridges distances. But what happens in virtual environments is, um, is there's a, there's, a different kind of trust. And so in the mid 90s, when I did my, um, my research on it, I isolated two types of trust. Um, one is relational trust, and that is trust that's based on the commonalities, the things we have in common, our shared experiences. It's what we think about when we think about trust building, we think about that. So traditional trust building, jumping out of trees, trust falls, it's really, you know, having our team dinners, really the opportunity to get to know each other in terms of that relational trust. In virtual environments, um, what happens most of the time is something that we call transactional trust building. And that's trust that's built based on the way in which we execute on our commitments and, and our tasks. And so it's about how we deliver, do we deliver on time as expected with the quality. Um, and so that believable communication means that if Jagasi, if I'm you know, handing something off to Jagasi and we're on a project and I'm handing her a data set of whatever, does she believe that my work is believable and that it is it has validity to it and that it's accurate? Because at that point, her reputation and her ability to do things depends on that. And the challenge is that the more distance we have to overcome, the more um, gaps there are in that trust building. And so we have to really, really pay attention to the ways in which we are conducting ourselves so that we are intentionally building relational and transactional trust. Um, so uh, we wrote a blog on this. Uh, it's on our website. If you haven't been to the Bridging Distance website, there's a blog space in there under resources. Um, and of course, you can like always you reach me. Frozen. Um, we lost you. What? You lost me? No, I can hear. I can hear Stephanie. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. We may have lost Kim though, but that's okay. Um, I'm sure we can. We'll figure it out. Yep. Of course. They'll send a note. So that's um, there's more on virtual trust in case um, in case you want to know more about that. But it's it's near and dear to my heart. The second um, tip is really around this idea of of, of creating um, electronic body language. And electronic body language is research that we did and started in 2004, five, and six. And it's really about um, how our electronic body, how our electronic actions and habits shape how we appear to others. So we call it our our electronic footprint, our virtual presence, reputation. So it's really kind of the so what of virtual etiquette. So you can take a, um, you can go online and, and, and watch good meeting facilitation, good email etiquette, all of those pieces, but it doesn't really matter because what's important is what, how other people interpret that. And what it looks like is really the assumptions that we make about others based on their electronic habits, right? It impacts and is informed by what we think are acceptable and unacceptable communication practices. So the more we have in common with people, more likely we're gonna have the same understanding of what's acceptable practices. But when you have global teams, you have different genders and all kinds of differences, you're gonna have a different understanding of what that is. And by the way, we just launched a research project looking at the ways in which national culture will impact people's technology. So stay tuned on that. So somebody needs to mute because it's uh, we're getting some noise in there. Um, and most often it's unconscious in terms of those judgments and it has a quick, make a quick determination about how um, and whether um, we're going to act or react. Um, so again, on um, looking at that, 
there's a couple of channels here that I think are important and I wanted you guys to go over. Um, number one is this idea of how do you make a choice about which modality to use because it's both how you use it but which choice you make. So two concepts in that. One is synchronous versus asynchronous and that's the idea of re real time or non real time. So a real time channel is what we're doing now where you can see me, you can hear me, everybody except him. Um, and so um, just being able to do that versus um, asynchronous, which is email, um, any kind of chat, IM, those are asynchronous, it's non real time. And the other one is whether or not push versus pull. So push means I'm making a choice to push information out to everybody and who's, who it gets pushed to. So email is a push, any kind of chat group, something is a push versus something that's a collaboration like a SharePoint or a Teams site where you just post it and everybody has access to it and they can pull the information towards them. So those are the channels in terms of thinking about that. And then two factors for that. One is this idea of social presence. Um, and that is um, how much interaction, how much contact connection do we need to have with each other? So um, do we need to be able to have so you need high social presence when you don't know people. Um, very often when you have um, lots of people with different uh, first languages or cultures, um, when you have conflicted situation, onboarding, um, when you really do need to see each other in order for things to be effective, developing new relationships. The other factor or a second factor is data or information richness. And that is the degree to which you need to be able to see um, something together rather, you know, rather than, than each other. You don't need that social presence. You don't need that, that relationship aspect to it. You really need the data. So if you're looking at financial data or you're designing a, 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 a clinical a trial protocol or you're doing something where you need to see information, you need more data richness. So those are, this is kind of a dual one where you can see the slides, um, but um, and you can, and we can see each other as well. So that's where the dual modality comes in. But those become two really large factors in terms of thinking about what, um, how do we make choices about which to choose? And in bridging distance, we call this technoractions, which is a contraction of two words, technological interactions. So the contraction of those two words becomes technoractions, and that is the modality choice. And again, thinking about what, how you make decisions about you know, why is she texting me? Why doesn't she just call? Or why did she send this email out as an attachment? Why didn't she just post it onto, you know, our team site or to a Google Drive or whatever it happens to be? And those undermine our reputation. So that's a little bit of an example in terms of we, how we're going along. Um, uh, Jagathy, because Kim's not on, I'm also going to ask you to monitor the chat if you could. Um, yep. That'd be great. Yep. Okay. The third is this idea of intentional presence. And this and the concept of building presence obviously goes hand in hand with trust and is near and dear to my heart. Um, so there's a great quote um, that I saw um, recently that said um, by a, a management uh, professor in, he's actually Italian, but he's working in France. And it's this concept that I think has become so prevalent in that it, it's easier being in each other's presence or in each other's absence than in the constant presence of each other's absence. So that means we're here and we are present with each other, but we're also absent because you're only seeing the top of my head and, and not in the room. And for Courtney, we're seeing the French courtyard as opposed to the, the train tracks or whatever it happens to be. And so there's, there's both information there, but a lack of information, and that can be exhausting. For people who will feel like you're digitally fatigued, we did a webinar a few months ago that you can see the recording of that on the website around digital fatigue and how you can manage that. So for presence, we're talking about this idea that, that giving people the sense that you are there for them, regardless of location, right? So if you are a manager who walks around and have people um, available to them, how do you do that digitally? So how do you amp up virtual presence? Mm -hmm. and some of that is really explicit, intentional, thoughtful, ongoing relationship building to be able to bridge that distance. And it really helps minimize digital isolation and loneliness. So if I have the sense that I can reach out and I can find Catalina, or I can find Karen, or I can find Jagathy, I'm not feeling so alone. And I also um, then might reach out and ask a question before it's too late. So it really helps kind of bridge some of that gap. And there's a great quote by Teddy Roosevelt that says, really, 
Most people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, and that becomes really important um, when you have to figure out, well, do I want to bother Jagathy or do I want to reach out to Catalina because she might think that I'm bothering her or whatever it happens to be. So a couple of ways in which you can then, some ideas here that you can take in terms of presence building behaviors. One is very, very clear and very important, and that is having aligned expectations about availability, about how you find each other, when you find each other, when you check back, all those pieces. Secondly, it's about um, maintaining regular contact, um, thinking about the impact and communicating the impact of decisions on people, so getting their buy-in, what's, what's this gonna be, and um, you know, it, what's gonna happen in Europe if we do this. Having drop-in hours where people can find you informally, they can drop in via chat or whatever it is. So, you know, Zoom office hours has become a really big thing over the last number of months. Um, knowing about other key people, so knowing key people at other locations. So if Jagathy and I are not in the same place, um, but Catalina and Courtney are um, at, in location with Jagathy, I might wanna get to know them so that they can be resources for me if I need anything. Um, managing interruptions, that's a really important aspect for electronic body language when um, you're being interrupted and you might, you might come off as digitally snarky um, without meaning to because you're at a deadline but somebody doesn't know that. So being able to use um, and not be interrupted when you can by either using your out of office or scheduling yourself for a meeting so that it shows up as do not disturb and then um, you can actually get um, what you need done. This was a really big deal when um, lots of kids were working from home, especially for moms who are trying to balance that. And let's face it, a lot of the responsibility fell to the moms. So we would say, why don't you schedule yourself as unavailable for a block of time that you can focus on your kids or do your work. Um, having more synchronous communications, um, working outside of normal hours, and really knowing about other locations and sites. Um, so that's kind of the individual. A couple of things, we did research on virtual teams. Again, we actually did four rounds of research over these 25 years. The most recent one came out in uh, um, late, 19, late uh, 2018. And overall, um, what we found is successful virtual teams. So those ladies that had high number on that teamness, this is really important, right? The overriding criteria for successful virtual teams was really looking at those patterns of interactions. So it means that you need to formalize them and have expectations about availability and how you're gonna do that. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you wanna know more, but there's those teams that are productive have presence with each other. So they connect with each other, not just the leader, people talk and listen, they see each other, they explore new ideas. And so there's a give and take that happens within that. So that's the virtual teams. And then lastly, as we wrap up, tip number four is this idea of looking at results-based performance management. So that means that we're managing by, by having what people are producing rather than what we perceive as they're producing. So I created this chart um, um, yesterday, actually, so you can let me know what you think. Um, again, I'm a consultant, so we, are, you know, we work by making one slide at a time. But we're working from this idea of moving from a, a mindset of the perception of somebody's competence at work. They work, the perception that they're working hard, they work a lot of hours. You know, I saw Karen and Anne Marie and their cars were in the parking lot early and they were still in there when I left, so they must be working hard. As a, and moving to these expectations for what we're gonna deliver and what the results are, right? Um, moving from defined working hours because the era of when you know you walk into an office and that's how i start my day and then i walk out of the office and my day ends that's long gone regardless of where you are and so you have to create for yourself this, these ideas these pockets of defined availability particularly if you're dealing with multiple time zones or people who are trying to flex right so the team and individuals define that um, monitoring computer use which is something that we found I, I was astounded still, even in March and April, how many leaders were asking IT to monitor keystrokes for people, how long people were on the VPN, whether the mouses were moving, all of the ways in which that, that's kind of an arbitrary and an inaccurate number of how people were working because I know for us, it may have been that I was offline because I didn't have bandwidth, right? Ask Kim that if she's back on, right? So moving towards expectations, 
for visibility and response. So what's our expected response time to each other? Again, goes back to that building of um, both relational and transactional trust and the credibility of electronic body language. Um, moving from formal evaluation feedback, so the annual performance review has moved and has to move to real-time feedback, both positive and negative. And then um, instead of delegating all the tasks at once, we have to move to these bite-sized pieces of information that get tossed around with reviews. Um, I was doing some consulting yesterday with a large um, financial services organization, and we talked about this idea of training, learning, and development, moving towards bite-sized knowledge. Um, in marketing, we call it snackable content, um, and so that idea of bite-sized becomes important. And then lastly, uh, free-form team checkups, being able to say, how's everybody doing? need to move to this formal status and the team KPI scorecards are ways in which we can formally track so that again if we think about the further you are out the more things have to be explicit and formal so that we know how to add value so we can be engaged and if I don't know how to add value I'm going to disengage and maybe not right now but eventually I'm going to look for work elsewhere where I feel like I can add value. So that's what we had. Um, I hope we have left enough time for some questions and answers and didn't talk too fast and overwhelm you. But I did want to um, see what kind of Q&A there was or responses or what else can I share with you that would be helpful. Stephanie, is here uh, as, as questions are coming in, and I certainly apologize. I don't know what happened here in my connection. But in any event, you know, it strikes me as you're talking about just in terms of the team performance and, you know, their interactions and how the manager sets the tone that there is quite a bit of responsibility on the, on the shoulders of the leader for ensuring, you know, again, both optimal team performance, but um, also setting the tone, that code of conduct of how associates are working with each other. As we, you know, sort of were, went out um, into remote working um, really overnight, um, you know, this isn't some, something that's necessarily in the toolbox of a lot of leaders and a lot of managers. So, you know, in terms of like resources and that types of thing, are you seeing that that's something that is really, you know, now much more of a, of a need and, you know, what kind of, what, where could you point people um, to resources to really help leaders manage in that space? So there's a lot of information. So we have um, a virtual leader workshop and I do a lot of virtual leadership coaching. And we're actually just launching what we're calling a virtual leader uh, round table or water cooler. And that's an opportunity for people to drop in as needed. Um, on our website, we also have a model that looks at creating community, directing digitally and engaging electronically. And those behaviors can really help people. But I think even just starting with this idea of being intentional mm -hmm. about what you do. So thinking about what's my leadership practice and how do I formalize that? So formalizing the informal becomes really important. Um, there's information on there. Um, there's there's um, some interesting other uh, resources um, um, that have come out. Um, I can um, send those to you and, and give them to some, some books that, that I would recommend on articles. Um, but I really think that for virtual leader, if you can really adopt an attitude of I'm gonna create presence, um, I think there has to be a level of authenticity and a level of humility, which is not hard for women, by the way. Um, it comes because um, I don't know what I don't know. And so if we approach this as I just need to know information, and instead of being the information source for everything, um, what I am is facilitating conversations about who has the information and how do we do that. And so moving towards a place of, of leaders in the center and knows everything to a place where leadership is a facilitation of virtual teamwork, that mentality can be really, really astounding in terms of that being able to be humble and authentic and say, I don't know, let's figure it out together. Because that's what we've been doing since March. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Tips on presenting ourselves virtually. Um, example of managing interruptions because we can't see people and their body language. Any thoughts on that? Uh, so I think some of that would be um, giving yourself permission to be unavailable. I can't stress that enough, especially now when we're getting pulled in multiple ways. Um, so giving yourself permission to not respond right away. 
So two thoughts for that. One is if it's a team and people you're interacting with frequently, having explicit agreements about how we respond. So if you need it within 48 hours, 24 hours, send me an email. If you need it within eight hours, send me a text. If you need it now, call me mm -hmm. um, or use Teams chat. So we're having kind of a level of urgency for our communications and interruptions. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, on the flip side, also those office hours can help in terms of the interruptions. But I think that if we can manage our schedules and the ways in which we're managing, because I don't think it's even a work-life balance right now, it's a work-life integration. You know, I've, uh, you know, there are so many ways in which the dogs are barking and I was sharing that I was coaching a gentleman whose granddaughter climbed in the, in the window behind him, you know, and she just wanted to see what he was doing. And so I think that integration um, is also a piece of it. And so, and being, and, and we are working more hours than ever before. Yep. And yep. so how do we, how do we regulate those? How do we say, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a lunch hour today. Yeah. Um, and go out and go for a walk. I talk a lot about walking meetings. So do we really have to, to be Zooming all the time or, or, or WebEx teams? Or can we just put on, um, on our earbuds or our phones and go for a walk while we're talking with somebody? Again, that goes to the criteria of social presence, information richness, and that channel choice in terms of how we're communicating. Was yeah. that helpful to whoever had the question? Did that answer it? And, and I think, you know, one of the things, you know, as you're talking about that, it kind of humanizes, right, yeah. the workforce. And in, so, I mean, again, thinking of silver linings around that, I think that, you know, that is something that, that you do hear about, that we're all people, right, and kind of takes away some of the, the mystery or the intimidation or, you know, some of those things. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you did so touch there's, there's a thought on this, Kim, because yeah. it's interesting because of, we've said all along, the technology dehumanizes our relationships. Yeah. So we have to intentionally rehumanize them. But I think one of the things that's happened in terms of really, really expediting this idea of quick trust is that there's a level of intimacy that happens as we have invited people into our homes um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. seen the background. And, and there's a level of intimacy that is just trust building in that way. And yeah. so um, there is that humanization that's taken place yeah. at a cost. Um, at a cost, but it is there. One of the things, one of the questions that came in that I think is an interesting one, and particularly for this group, <clears throat> you did mention that women are better at this, right? You know, in terms of kind of managing those pieces. Yeah. Um, is there anything, you know, that you can do to amplify um, our native strengths, anything that we can do? Any thoughts on that? So our research actually just found out again that women are innately um, better wired whether it's socially, uh, whether it's bred that way or, or biological to nature or nurture, um, because relationship building comes much more naturally to us um, because we do it. And so technology or all the other things are simply obstacles to be overcome mm -hmm. as opposed to, um, uh, I can't do that. I'm not gonna reach out to Carrie because it's just too hard to find her or you know she doesn't have the right technology and therefore, um, I'm going to be dismissive. So I think for us to, to be unapologetic about the fact that relationships make the difference in terms of engagement, interdependency, right? So again, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you can rely on those relationships, it really becomes the grease for that interdependence and the ways in which we're working. So don't apologize for putting people first. Um, figure out how to be natural in that style. And it is, um, it is exponentially better um, to focus on the relationships because then the tasks um, kind of come by themselves, not by themselves, but they're easier to manage. Does that answer the question for whoever asked it? It, it felt that was my question. So yes, it does. <laughs> I imagine there's an element of the ability to multitask too, right? That kind of creates, you know, that, a, a, a better outcome as well. But, um, you know, the other thing I'm thinking of just in terms of commenting on the, um, you know, you're talking about the performance reviews and <clears throat> more that of how we're measuring and more snackable. I also, you know, silver lining there, I think of, you know, when there were um, having a team with, with limited folks out in the field, 
now everybody is evaluated the same way. Everybody's in the same place. So I, I would imagine there may be some element of this is more equitable to some extent, right? You know, in terms of how we're measuring and, and how we're evaluating people because there's not part of the team that's right under the manager's nose, but you know, everybody is on that level playing field, which, you know, I, again, some silver linings with all of this. Um, there is, I think some of it will depend on how long, how long it lasts, right? Because right. right. we can rely on existing in-person relationships and kind of ride those coattails for a little bit, but eventually that'll get old. Yep, exactly. So, um, may I ask a question directly? Let's see if we could get some dialogue from Stephanie on something specific, and that is, you know, this is very much a financial and technology group, and a lot of what we talk about here, we try to talk about is innovation and creativity. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are around um, how, what the impact has been around this virtual work environment. What have you seen in terms of innovation and creativity and any tips to really help that? Because I think some of what was, has been going on, uh, especially in the agile space has been some of that physical collaboration, you mm -hmm. know, actually, um, you know, whiteboarding ideas and getting people really thinking about things collaboratively. How do you see technology and this virtual environment impacting that thought process? Um, so a couple of things. One is, I think previously, virtual meetings uh, were meetings to inform people about the work that was being done outside of the meeting, right? And mm -hmm. so it was, um, here's what I've been working on, here's what Anne Marie's working on, here's what Karen's working on, um, whatever it is. I think that one of the things that has happened is over time, both naturally, and we've worked on this in a lot of team buildings, is that work is taking place in the meetings much more frequently since March than we saw um, before that. And so people are using things like, you know, I can't tell you how many people didn't even know that Zoom or Teams or those had those electronic whiteboards. So we're taking those behaviors that we know work and intuitively, naturally, or, or not naturally, applying them to the technologies. And the technologies, honestly, are also becoming more um, robust um, and, and being able to work those. So the meetings are no longer just about what's happening in status. The meetings are actually working meetings for people. And that both breeds the innovation, it breeds that social presence that I talked about earlier, but it also breeds the connection and the development of both transactional and relational trust. And that becomes really important because don't forget, we have to trust each other because we have to be able to take risks and you cannot innovate in a risk averse environment. So as we become comfortable with those technologies, it becomes really important to maintain that level of trust and they go hand in hand. Again, women, I think in terms of, you know, not that I'm biased, but um, women are certainly adapt and are able to pay attention in different ways to that. Um, and the agile piece in terms of something being iterative um, is only a bonus to innovation because again, you make it snackable on that iterative piece and you're, you're actually going down to one of the points that I made around moving from everything being defined at once, the old project way to the agile way um, even becomes that much more important when you have that level of distance. Did that help in terms yeah. of your question? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to talk more about it because I could talk about this <laughs> a lot. <clears throat> and maybe we'd love to have you come back and do just that. We could have another segment because, again, Stephanie, we just thank you so much for your insight, for your time. I want to be um, respectful of, of people's calendars and so forth. But, again, I think you've, you've given us so much valuable information that we can incorporate, you know, in, in now. Um, as well as we're in this for the long run. So again, many, yep. many thanks for your expertise and sure. for answering our questions and, um, and truly thank you. Yep. Um, Pleasure. Just very, and just very quickly before we sign off, I just wanted to mention that our next session, <clears throat> excuse me, will be August um, 5th. I can't believe we're talking about August already. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have an academic discussion. Again, another you know, arena that was just impacted dramatically in terms of what was happening in the classroom, um, in terms of career search, and really what the, how that has impacted, you know, jobs as well as, you know, the job search process going forward. So we're excited to have Abu Jalil, um, our ally and um, friend from Suffolk University, a chair of finance, and Sherry Paulson, who's a senior director of the Graduate Center 
uh, for career development. So they will be here. We'll have more of a panel discussion with them on some of those themes. So again, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, this yep, is just absolutely. Yeah. And you all. Yep. And for people who want, we send out tips so you can you can sign up and get information on the website. We have a ton of stuff on there. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks. Thanks. Nice Thanks. to see everybody.